fear not, I am the first and the last. I am he that liveth and was dead. And behold, I am alive forevermore. I am the first and I am the last. And beside me there is no God. Well, uh, I'm not really sure who the agency is that I should address this video to. Because I'm not really sure who uh, is the employer of Martin Richling. I know it's not the Lord. But uh, I've been doing some research into this guy. And uh, it's interesting because I had heard Sam Gipp uh, came out with a video against Steven Anderson. And he said about how that years and years ago he had told his wife that uh, there would come a day. He said, I bet you there's going to come a day when the devil's going to raise up people that act like they're King James Bible believers in an effort to make us look bad. And he said that he believes that Steven Anderson is one of them. I agree 100% with that. And also you have Westboro Baptist Church, you know, and uh, they're not Baptist and they're not Christian. They hate the Jews and they're, you know, hyper-Calvinist and a whole bunch of other things. You know, and, you know, I've seen guys street preaching against them and they'll, they'll start swearing at the street preachers, you know, using profanity. They're not saved. And, uh, you know, Stephen Anderson uses profanity too when you push him hard enough. But uh, Martin Richling... Uh, you know, honestly, you know, anybody that would think that that guy is saved, I feel real bad for you because he fails so many tests of Scripture uh, that prove whether or not somebody's saved. You see, there's something within us Christians that government operatives or uh, Jesuit, undercover Jesuits, they can't fake one thing within a Christian, and that is the Holy Spirit of witness. They aren't able to do that. And you see, those of you out there that have listened to my sermons, listened to my preaching, and I preach something, say something from the Word of God, and you're going through that thing in your life, or, or you're thinking the same thing, or whatever else, you see, that's the Holy Spirit coming through my mouth, because I'm getting it from the book, and He's testifying and bearing witness to the Holy Spirit that's within you. Okay, It's the same Spirit that abides in the church. That's why you can come to a Bible-believing ministry like mine and the Holy Spirit bears witness. You go, oh, yeah, wow, that's so good. That's so true. Yeah, that's exactly, I've been through that same thing. Wow, yeah. See? Now, you can get somebody that can train themselves to look like a King James Bible believer, but they can't fake that Holy Spirit bearing witness. And I know I've been contacted from people, brothers and sisters, from other countries even, not just America, and they say that they try to watch this Martin Richling, and they can't even watch the guy. Within five or so minutes, they're going, oh, oh, this guy just so filled with just vile hatred, anger, just, he's so bitter, he just, he's disgusting. You know why? Because it's not the Holy Spirit that's within this man. It's a spirit of a devil. You know? And I'll grant you, he looks like he might be a King James Bible believer, but when you start to add up everything and you actually listen to the guy, you go, wait a second here. Uh-uh. And you say, well, uh, could you give us some examples of Scripture that prove that this man is false, that he's a false prophet? Absolutely. We're going to look at a couple things here. John chapter 10. I want to show you the very first thing that convinced me that this man is a lost, hell-bound sinner. John chapter 10 Verse 11 and 12 says here, I am the good shepherd. The good shepherd giveth his life for the sheep. But he that is an hireling, and not the shepherd, whose own the sheep are not, seeth the wolf coming, and leaveth the sheep, and fleeth, and the wolf catcheth them, and scattereth the sheep. Okay? Now, first of all, let me just explain something. When a preacher is preaching the word, I am not the shepherd of the sheep in terms of on the same level as Jesus Christ. All right, Jesus Christ is perfect. I'm not. I'll make mistakes sometimes. I don't preach 100% pure, perfect doctrine. Jesus Christ did. He was truth manifested in the flesh. I can make mistakes, okay? But, but, I am in that same kind of a thing there where I'm supposed to watch over the flock that the Lord has given me. What did he tell Peter after he was, you know, ascended up from, you know, raised from the dead? He said, feed my sheep. That's my job. I'm supposed to feed the flock of God, which is among you, taking the oversight thereof, 
you know, that's what I'm supposed to do. I'm supposed to feed you the Word of God. And with, you know, over 400 videos, I think that there's plenty of, a, you know, a good meal out there for you if you want to be fed. You come to this channel, you're not going to get a lot of fluff, you're going to get a lot of scripture. You're going to get a lot of years and years and years of research. I researched for probably almost 10 years before I even went into ministry. So, if you know, if you've been around the ministry, you know that you get fed here. All right? I'm doing my job. I'm not a hireling. And by the way, it says here, when the hireling is there, and he doesn't really care for the sheep, he's just there for the income, the wolf comes... And the hireling runs away from the wolf. Now, Martin Richling is a wolf. And I'm not about to run away from this little dweeb, okay? This little nothing. This little lost sinner that's got major anger issues, okay? I'm not going to run away from this little jerk. All right, I'm going to confront him, and I'm going to show you that he is a false prophet. But did you notice there what the wolf does? It says, when the hireling leaves the sheep and fleeth, the wolf catcheth them, the sheep, and scattereth the sheep. Who does the wolf go after? The sheep. And I would not have even given this Martin Richling the time of day if it hadn't been for the fact that he's attacking the sheep. I don't appreciate that. And you see, a legitimate ministry does not need to go and attack the following. I have never one time, never once, have I gotten onto somebody else's channel and gone and, and it contacted all the people that are commenting positively and tried to turn them to my channel. I've never once had to do that. You know why? Because the Lord bears witness to the truth. I don't need to go along and try to steal somebody else's congregation, somebody else's flock. I don't need to try and steal them and try to go after the sheep. So see, by this test right here in John chapter 10, Martin Richling proves that he is a wolf, that he is a false prophet. Hey, Hey there, Marty, if you're preaching the truth, why don't you just preach it? If you have the truth, if you're, the, if you're this great man of God, that God showed you these wonderful things while you were in federal prison, which we're going to be talking about that in a minute, if, if you're such a great man of God, then just preach the word and God will bring the increase. The Lord will bring people to you because you're spreading the truth. You don't need to go and attack somebody else's ministry by going after the sheep and sending private messages, and sending links to your stupid video attacking me personally. You don't need to do that. You see, right there, test number one, you just proved that you're a wolf. You proved that you're not right with God. Alright? And uh, talking about the federal prison thing. I have right here an article. This is the, uh, where is it here? Tribune, Chicago Tribune, I think it is. Judge gives former cop 57 months. I'm going to put it up on screen. Ex-Melrose Park officer convicted in shakedowns. A former Melrose Park police officer who was convicted of shaking down an illegal immigrant involved in a hit-and-run accident and the mother of a crack cocaine addict was sentenced Thursday to nearly five years in prison. U.S. District Judge Blanche Manning called Martin Richling and a second ex-Melrose police officer who was convicted with him a, quote, two-man crime wave. This is the pastor. The public society put trust in you to serve and protect them, and you violated that trust in the worst way, Manning said uh, moments before she imposed, uh, I think they have that wrong there, Manning said, uh, oh, Blanche Manning, okay, sorry. Manning said moments before she imposed the 57-month prison term. She also fined Richling $5,000. Last November, a federal jury in Chicago convicted Richling and co-defendant Nick Filskov, now both 35, on one count each of racketeering, extortion, and conspiracy to violate the civil rights of the extortion victims. This is June 20th, 1997, by the way. So if you look at Martin Richling, he's obviously older than 35 now. But the point is there... Racketeering, extortion, and conspiracy is what Martin Richling was convicted of. And you say, well, brother, that was in his past. That's before he got saved. Yeah, but uh, if you look at another website, which I'm going to show you, um, he does not repent of that. 
he said that he was working with the FBI to, to, to expose corrupt police officers, and the FBI turned on him, and therefore he got framed and went to jail as a result. Okay, even if that was true, what did Stephen say when he was being stoned to death? He said, forgive them, Father, they know not what they do. What did Jesus Christ say when he was dying on the cross? Forgive them, Father, for they know not what they do. Even if you were framed Martin Richling, even if that was true, where's your spirit of forgiveness? And I highly doubt that you were framed. I think that you're a crooked cop. And it comes through in the way you, you know, preach. You just, you act just like a crooked cop. Chicago Mafia, you know, on the payroll of the Chicago Mafia kind of a cop. You know? And you see, a real Christian can look at you and they can see right through your little thin veneer to the anger and the hatred that you have underneath. Before we continue here, I want to show you something else that's very interesting. Got on this, uh, there was this really new age, had all these weird, wacko new agers, you know, on this radio station, and Martin Richling's on the thing, and they say, oh, he's no longer broadcasting. But I want to show you something very interesting here about what he says in his profile. Look at this, it talks about here you can see, I'm going to put the screen thing up. It says here that when he was young, he was raised as a Roman Catholic, and he wanted to be a Jesuit priest when he got older. Um, maybe he got his wish. Do you think? I mean, if Martin Richling was a Jesuit, if he was a Jesuit plant, and they said, we want you to act like you're a King James Bible believer, you say, okay, Let's do a criminal investigation here. Let's think about this. What would be the point of Martin Richling basically coming out and acting like he's a King James Bible believer? Well, because the lost world right now understands that there's coming a rapture and that there's going to be a lot of King James Bible believers leaving at the rapture. Now, what would be the best thing to do to cover up that? Raise up some of your own King James Bible believing preachers and have them here for after the rapture so that you can cover it up. You say, well, see, this guy's been in ministry for years. Look at him. He's a King James Bible believing preacher. He didn't get raptured. It wasn't the rapture. You see? And I believe that that's what Martin Richling is. I mean, the guy, the guy wanted to be a Jesuit growing up. He's in the military, in the Marine Corps. Then he's a crooked cop. And he works with the FBI, and then he goes to federal prison. And in federal prison, there are many, many times that the FBI cuts deals with prisoners and says, we'll let you out earlier, we'll work, you know, you can become an informant for us. No, in fact, that's what happened to Randy Weaver out at, at Ruby Ridge. It was an FBI informant, it was a guy that was convicted of crimes and things like that, and he framed Randy Weaver. Fritz Springmeyer, another good example. Fritz Springmeyer got framed by a guy that was an FBI informant. Happens all the time. And you see, I believe that uh, these people, whoever they are, whatever agency, whether the Jesuits or the FBI or the CIA or, you know, God only knows, and, well, the devil knows too because he controls them. But uh, I believe that they're, they're raising up these false ministers of Satan and making them look like they're King James Bible believers in an effort to cover up when the rapture happens. And uh, another, you know what else is interesting? Martin Richling teaches against the pre-trib rapture. What a shock, you know? I mean, you wouldn't think, a, a, you know, if this guy's so, he understands the King James Bible and he's read it from cover to cover 300 times and, and he reads it eight hours a day and yet the Holy Spirit can't give you enough truth to show you that the pre-trib rapture is scriptural? Boy, you're something, aren't you? Ecclesiastes chapter 7, verse 9. I'll show you real quick here. And like I've, I've been saying this, you know, I just want to read this scripture to con confirm what I've been saying. Ecclesiastes 7, verse 9. Be not hasty in thy spirit to be angry, for anger resteth in the bosom of fools. Like Martin Richling. Martin Richling is a fool. I mean, people. If you can't tell that I'm saved in 
five minutes of looking at my channel, I feel bad for you. You know, I really do. It's ridiculous. Be getting more into that as we continue here. And like I said, you know, there are some things that these, uh, I don't know what you want to call them, double agents or, or uh, agent provocateurs, or I'm not sure what you'd want to, what would be the technical term for them. But these guys that are being raised up by Satan to try and make Bible believers look bad, you know, they can fake it pretty good, but you can't fake the Holy Spirit, you know, the true Holy Spirit. It'll come out, you know, and you'll be watching and it'll be like, eh, this guy isn't hacking it. Galatians chapter 5. Now, verse 19, Now the works of the flesh are manifest, which are these, adultery, fornication, uncleanness, lasciviousness, idolatry, witchcraft, hatred, like Martin Richling has, variance, emulations, wrath, wrath, you know, strife, kind of like having your whole channel being about, you know, calling out men as heretics. And you come to my channel and you say, Brian Denlinger the heretic, Brian Denlinger the heretic, Brian Denlinger the heretic. <laughs> you know, get a life, man. You know, give me a break. Why don't you just preach the word and let the Lord sort, sort things out? If you're really saved, and you're not. But if you are saved there, Marty, why don't you just preach the word? Huh? You pathetic little imp. Strife, seditions, heresies. Hello, Marty. Envyings, murders, drunkenness, revelings, and such like, of the which I tell you before, as I have also told you in time past, that they which do such things shall not inherit the kingdom of God. But the fruit of the Spirit is love. Do you have any law, love there, Marty? Love of money, perhaps. That's why you were guilty of extortion, shaking people down, you know, like you're still trying to do to the body of Christ. Uh, joy. Hi, Marty. Hi. Peace. Long-suffering. Gentleness. People, watch my videos and compare them to Martin Richling's videos. I get sarcastic. Sure, I get sarcastic. But I also have a spirit of gentleness. Okay? <laughs> Goodness, faith, meekness, temperance against such, there is no law. And, you know, the big thing here that uh, the loser Martin Richling comes out with, is he says that uh, Romans chapter 10 has nothing to do with your salvation. The, the, the prayer of salvation is a work. It's a work. Ugh. Okay, let's look at it. Romans chapter 10, verses 8 through 13. And I'm going to get more into this in the future when I have more time to actually, you know, go through his stupid videos and watch some of them. You know, because, you know, I let me just say this. Just simply praying a prayer of salvation, no, that doesn't do it. But that's not what my salvation video is about. I go through all the scriptures showing people you are a sinner, you cannot save yourself. And then after that, after we have established that they are sinners and they need to repent... Okay, of their self-righteousness, of that life of sin, of saying, I'm just good enough to get in. All I have to do is just believe and, and receive. You know, that's it. Just believe and receive. You know, see, then I lead people into a prayer after we've established the thing of repentance, biblical repentance. All right, and I've got tons of sermons on this thing. You know, Martin Richling is just another easy believism heretic, among other things. But uh, let's read here. Romans chapter 10, verses 8 through 13. But what saith it? The word is nigh thee, even in thy mouth and in thy heart. That is the word of faith which we preach. The word of faith which we preach. That if thou shalt confess with thy mouth the Lord Jesus, and shalt believe in thine heart that God hath raised him from the dead, thou shalt be saved. Okay? Salvation. Verse 10. For with the heart man believeth unto righteousness, and with the mouth, mouth, this little thing right here, you see, mouth, see, this is called a mouth, Martin. Confession is made unto salvation. For the scripture saith, Whosoever believeth on him shall not be ashamed, for there is, neither, uh, for there is no difference between the Jew and the Greek, for the same Lord over all is rich unto all that call upon him. For whosoever shall call upon the name of the Lord shall not be saved because prayer is a work. <laughs> well, according to Martin Richling, perhaps. No, it says, uh, For whosoever shall call upon the name of the Lord shall be saved. You see, what's the point here? The point is, let's go to Acts chapter 10, or excuse me, Acts chapter 20, verse 21. 
This is one of the most damnable heresies that has been spread around here in the last couple of years, and it's getting more and more prevalent, and I've kicked it time and time and time and time again. Acts chapter 20, verse 21. Testifying both to the, to the Jews and also to the Greeks, repentance toward God and faith toward our Lord Jesus Christ. You say, that's two different things. Yeah, but it happens at the same time. You come to God as a sinner, you give up your self-righteousness, and you pray to God. See? How can you have repentance toward God just simply by believing? See? You have to come to God and say, God, I realize now that I'm a sinner. I know I can't save myself. You know, Is there some specific prayer that you have to pray? No. You pray the way that you know how. And if you don't know how, you, the Christian says, okay, I'm going to lead you in this prayer. There's nothing wrong with that. Nothing at all. But see, what these guys are trying to do is they're trying to say it's belief. Just simply believe. Believe. Only believe. You know? Well, how's repentance come into that whole thing? See? See, that's the problem. And they say, well, repentance is a work. You're, you're trying to do works. When the Bible condemns works for salvation, it's good works for salvation. Not of works, lest any man should boast. What do you boast about repentance? You boast about being a sinner? You boast about being no good and having to pray to the Lord to be saved? No, what you boast about is, I've done good things. I've tithed at my church and I've been a faithful member all these years and I've been baptized. And I, that's what you boast about. See, what is condemned in Scripture as works-based salvation is people doing good works to be saved. Somebody come, come to God and praying and saying, God, please have mercy upon me, a sinner. You know? That's not somebody uh, doing works to be saved. I mean, that's ridiculous. And I mean, you read there in Romans chapter 10, verses 8 through 13, nobody's going to come away with Martin Richling's, you know, belief here, with his philosophy. And see, too, another little point I want to make here. When I'm preaching and saying to people, you need to get saved by coming to God as a sinner, repenting of your self-righteousness, saying, I can't save myself, understanding that up here in your mind, and saying those sins that I've committed in my life, you know, my conscience bearing witness, the Ten Commandments there that are written in my heart, you know, that those laws of God that I've broken have put me into a bad situation. And I need to come to God and pray to God that he will forgive those sins and I put my faith totally in Jesus Christ. See, belief is part of the equation there. I'm not excluding belief and saying it's just works. I'm not doing that. So this whole this whole philosophy of Martin Richling is just it's it's beyond ridiculous. And what what are they doing? What are they doing? They're trying to tell people it's just believe and receive. You don't have to be a new creature in Christ Jesus. You don't have to be born again. Okay? You say, I, I'm not convinced. It's only believe. Only believe. It's just believe. Well, what's the greatest uh, passage of Scripture in your New Testament on the subject of the Gospel? What is the Gospel? Where, it's, where is it defined? 1 Corinthians chapter 15. 1 Corinthians chapter 15, verse 1 and 2 says, Moreover, brethren, I declare unto you the gospel which I preached unto you, which also ye have received, and wherein ye stand. This is the gospel. Now look at verse 2. By which also ye are saved, if ye keep in memory what I preached unto you, unless ye have believed in vain. Is it possible to believe in vain? Oh no, because everybody that believes is saved. You know, 75% of America right now is professing Christian, so bless God, 75% of Americans are saved. And you can certainly see the signs of that, can't you? No. The fact of the matter is there's a lot of people that have believed, and they've done it in vain. Why? There's no repentance involved with their salvation. They haven't come to God as a sinner. They're there in their self-righteousness. They come and they say, sure, I believe in Jesus. But I'm not going to have anybody tell me what to do. I'm not going to have any book tell me how to live. I'll just go on doing whatever I feel like doing. You're not going to tell me how to live. And you want me to believe those people are saved, huh? Why is it then that Paul talked about being in perils with false brethren? In perils among 
false brethren. Why is that? Hey, Paul, it's only believe. I mean, if they believe, then obviously they're saved. They could, there couldn't be false brethren if it's just belief. You see the mess you get into? And uh, one other thing here I'm going to cover. Romans chapter 16. This incredible idiot, Martin Richling, comes along and he says that uh, God has an establishment commandment. And if you don't preach the establishment commandment, then you're not a legitimate preacher. That's what he says. And it's in first, or excuse me, Romans chapter 16, verses uh, 25 through 27. That's where the establishment commandment is. So let's work, look here for the words establishment commandment. You ready? Verse 25. Now to him that is of power to establish you according to my gospel and the preaching of Jesus Christ according to the revelation of the mystery which was kept secret since the world began but is now made manifest and by the scriptures of the prophets according to the commandment of the everlasting God made known to all nations for the obedience of faith to God only wise be glory through Jesus Christ forever. Amen. Wait a second there. I was looking for the term establishment commandment. I must have gone past it. Or perhaps it's not in there. Yeah, it's not in there. And you look into what this establishment commandment is, it's basically some kind of a weird form of hyper-dispensational, you have to start out in the book of Romans, and then you read forward, and you go into Revelation, and you can go back and read other parts of the Bible, and, 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 you know, and Martin Richling is the man that it was revealed to. Well, praise the Lord. I mean, 2,000 years of church history and no one's ever seen this before. And God chooses Martin Richling, you know, ex-cop, you know, extortion, conspiracy, you know, whatever. You know, God chooses this great soldier of God to reveal this truth to. And all other preachers are illegitimate. D.L. Moody, sorry, he was no good. Uh, J. Wilbur Chapman, nope. J. Frank Norris, nah. You know, P Dr. Peter Ruckman, nope. Sam Gipp, nope. Sorry, all these guys are just stupid, you know, because they didn't, they didn't read the Bible through God's establishment commandment. So they're all illegitimate. No, I think it's a Richling that's illegitimate. And Martin Richling is just one of a handful of ministers of Satan that God, or that, excuse me, yeah, the God of this world, I'll say it that way, that the devil is raising up. And uh, I'm going to tell you right now, folks, uh, you can... You can tell from reading your King James Bible that this guy is false. But don't discount the Holy Spirit within you bearing witness. And I know a lot of you have contacted me and, and told me how the Lord has just blessed you tremendously from listening to my ministry. Excuse me, my ministry. I appreciate that. And, uh, you know, it's always amazing too. I mean, there are times when my wife and I will be having a conversation and we'll go in and check email or something like that, and somebody in the email has written about the thing that we were discussing out here. Now you explain that. You say, what is it? It's the Holy Spirit. The Spirit, one Spirit that's within us. And the Jesuits and the FBI and the CIA or whoever, they can't fake that. Their Spirit that's in them does not bear witness with our Spirit. So when you hear a guy like Martin Richling and you watch one of his idiot videos, and I'm not telling you to do that. I mean, you know, I'd stay away from the guy, to be honest with you. But if you ever click on one of his videos and watch it, you know, you'll feel a different spirit there. I mean, somebody sent me one of his videos uh, probably half a year ago, maybe longer. And I watched it just a couple minutes, and I was like, this guy is just a total jerk. I mean, I can I can handle people being sarcastic and being arrogant and whatever else, but this guy's beyond that. It's a different spirit in him. I mean, he's just ah, he's just nasty, just a nasty creature, you know. He's a false prophet. He's a wolf, and he's coming after the sheep. All right, and men like him are going to be are being raised up right now for after the rapture, because after the rapture. Guys like him are going to come out and they're going to be like, oh, you know, saying whatever they want to say. You know, I don't even know how they're going to be used by Satan yet. But, uh, you know, 
he'll get a nice paycheck. And of course, that's what he's all about. I mean, he was trying to shake down people. He's all about First Timothy chapter six, verse ten. You know, he's uh, in love with money, and his god is Mammon. And you know, I'm sure he's pay, probably being paid well right now to pose as a King James Bible believer. And uh, don't listen to the guy. Uh, just, uh, you know, I wouldn't have even paid attention to this guy if it hadn't been the fact that he's coming after the sheep that the Lord has put into, under my ministry. You know, I know a lot of Christians are brand new and they've only been saved for just a short time. And, and uh, there's a lot of things you have to learn. And it just really frustrates me when, I mean, I don't care about people attacking me. That's just going to happen. Um, but this is the first time that somebody has gone to my subscribers and actually they're working hard to send them links to this stupid video that Martin Richling did. That ticks me off. Okay, That's what a wolf does. A wolf comes after the sheep and tries to scatter them, tries to turn them away from the ministry. And you say, has that happened, Brian? No, actually, uh, we've gone up, I think, since Martin Richling made his stupid video. I think we've gone up about 300 subscribers since then, something like that. So, uh, you know, it's not working there, Martin. If you're a real man of God, why don't you just shut up? Just shut up trying to expose everybody and prove how good and godly you are and just preach the word. And God will bring the increase if you're real and legitimate. Of course you're not. You know, what you need to do is there, Martin Richling, you need to realize that you are a sinner. And that no amount of money in the world is worth what you are doing. You are going to get left behind. You are being used of Satan right now. And what's going to happen to you is the people that you work for that you think are, you know, you're being loyal to them, they're going to turn on you eventually. And you're going to be thrown out. And Satan, who you're really working for, he hates your guts too. The best thing that you could do is just humble yourself before the Lord, come to Him as a sinner, pray, and ask for His forgiveness. Come to Him and say, I've been fake. I'm a fake. I, I, I know this is probably, you know, it might cost you your life because you're probably under some kind of con contract or whatever else. I don't even know how the thing works. But the point is, you're false. I can see through you. So can other members of the body of Christ. They can see through your little scam that you are. And if you don't get saved, you're going to go to hell. And you're going to burn. And I'm going to tell you right now, you're going to burn very, very hot. <laughs> uh, because you're faking. You're faking being a Bible believer. And the Lord takes that very ser seriously. Okay. Uh, remember that uh, it was Lucifer that said, Ye can be as, or he wanted to be like God. I will be like the Most High God. It's very dangerous to try and fake being a Christian or fake trying to be the Lord. You know? Very, very dangerous. So, that's going to be it for this video. Um, I am going to come out with a video in the future on the subject of the sinner's prayer. And I'm going to give you the scriptures for it. And I'm going to give you the warning that, you know, yeah, just praying some prayer without any preaching on sin, without any repentance, yeah, it is dangerous just to pray a prayer. You know, you get to some guy, it's every head, every head bowed, every eye closed, no one looking around. If you're here today and you don't know Jesus as your Savior, would you pray this prayer with me? Say, Dear Lord Jesus, Dear Lord Jesus, I come to you as a sinner. I mean, that is false. I am against that. Okay? But when you get somebody to a point where they understand that they're a sinner, and they understand that they cannot possibly be good enough to get to heaven on their own, and at that point in time, they realize... I'm not right with God, and they call upon the name of the Lord to be saved, that's not works-based salvation. That's true biblical salvation. Repentance toward God and faith toward our Lord Jesus Christ. It's all part of the same deal. You can't be saved until you are a sinner. It is a faithful saying and worthy of all acceptation that Christ Jesus came into the world to save sinners. Ye must be born again. Without the new birth, without becoming a new creature in Christ Jesus, you're going to go to hell and you're going to burn. It's just as simple as that. And I don't care who comes out with what, I will never back off on the issue of repentance to salvation. I'll never do it. God commandeth all men everywhere to repent. Jesus said, I'm not come to call the righteous, but sinners to repentance. It's right there. 
So, you better get right. That's going to be it. I'll be making some more videos when I can get the time to. So, please keep praying for the ministry. We will keep everybody posted as much as we can. Thank you. I want to talk to you here for a little bit about Martin Richling's Other Christ. Uh, Martin Richling does not worship the Jesus Christ of the Bible. He worships the Jehovah's Witness false Christ, a Christ that was created. Okay? And uh, I'm going to play this thing here for you. But well, first, let's go to Revelation chapter 3, verse 14. Many of you have heard of this thing already, that this wicked little devil, uh, Martin Richling, he calls himself a pastor. The guy, the guy is such a joke. You know, he plays videos and he'll like play two minutes and then he does this little like impy like devil laughing. <laughs> and, and then he like attacks people. He attacks them personally and, you know, makes fun of them and, and all this stuff, you know. And a guy tries to say he's teaching the Bible and everything else and, you know, it's, I'm, I'm the brave, you know, Martin Richling. I just don't allow comments or ratings on my videos, but, you know, whatever. Revelation chapter 3, verse 14. And unto the angel of the church of the Laodiceans write, These things saith the Amen, the faithful and true witness, the beginning of the creation of God. Now, what you're going to hear in this audio recording coming up is Martin Richling actually saying that Jesus Christ is a created being. Now, let me just explain this thing. When you say that you're the beginning of the creation of God, that means that you are God and you are there in the beginning. Okay? Um... My wife and I bought land not too far from where this building is. We're going to have to be there in the beginning of the creation of a home. That doesn't mean that we ourselves are going to be the home or that we are created. We're going to have to be there in the beginning of the creation of a home. See? Jesus Christ is there in the beginning. He is the beginning of the creation of God. God didn't create him. And I'm going to prove that to you in this study today. I'm going to show you lots of scriptures, which, which uh, little Richling there apparently doesn't know. But let's listen to the audio here. Here it is. Listen, I'm going to tell you a big pill to swallow. I've never taught it to you, but I'm teaching it to you now because it come up here. And some of you may wonder, Jesus Christ was the firstborn of every creature. Jesus Christ is created by God the Father. That's why Christ says, my Father is greater than I. He says that, yes, he's equal to the Father in relationship. But when it comes to power, Jesus Christ was the beginning, verse 14 says, of the creation of God. And after God created Jesus Christ, okay, then Jesus Christ and God the Father and the Holy Spirit created everything else. Don't you know, in Genesis chapter 1, go with me there, Genesis chapter 1, verse 1, In the beginning God created the heaven and the earth. Look at verse 3, And God said, Let there be light, and there was light. Who do you think the light is there? What do you think that light is that God said, Let there be light? The sun isn't created till days later. The moon isn't created till days later. You see that? The sun, the moon, and the stars are created on the fourth day. So what's this light? The light of the world in John chapter 1 is Jesus Christ. The light created there in Genesis 1 is Jesus Christ. Now people think I'm a heretic nut. Let me tell you what. If you read this Bible and let the Bible just speak on itself, and don't come at come to it with preconceived ideas, you will see that Jesus Christ is the beginning of the creation of God. He's the beginning. That's the light there in Genesis 1. That matches the light of John 1. He's the light. Okay, capital L. But here in Revelation 3, where it says he's the beginning of the creation of God, Colossians is saying the same thing. If you look in Colossians 1.15, who is the image of the invisible God, the firstborn of every creature. Jesus Christ is the firstborn. He's a created son of God. God created him. Okay? These people who teach that Jesus Christ was always there, as God has always, see, God has always been there, don't know the scriptures. What do you do with the verses I just showed you? They don't do anything with them. Wow, what, 
what uh, scriptural exposition there, buddy. Oh boy, he's this guy's a genius, man. He he's read through the Bible. I read the Bible eight hours a day and three hundred times through. <laughs> you know, <laughs> God, it cracks me up. You know, oh, no pride there. You know, but uh, here he posted this on his website. Just in case you think, well, he said that, but he took it back. This is just the other day, the twenty seventh here of January, two thousand fourteen. He says, I'll put it up on screen. Here is a Bible test for your wicked hearts, you so-called King James Bible believers. Boy, you feel the love there, you know. The Lord Jesus Christ says this about his own self. Revelation 3.14 quotes the verse we just read earlier. Do you believe sixth grade English? Nope. So what do you do? You rest the scriptures to match your thinking, and guess what? You then are agreeing with the Satanic NIV Bible. Huh? Uh, so in other words... He comes out and rests the scriptures, makes it say something it doesn't say, and then he blames you for sticking by what the Bible actually says. And he says, you're resting the scriptures because you don't say that, it's, that Jesus is created. This guy is uh, quite messed up. Let me just uh, put that thing down. Now I'm going to show you the scriptures. So is Jesus Christ a created being? Is he a creation of God? Well, let's look about this thing. Notice it says there in, in Revelation 3.14, the beginning of the creation of God. The beginning. John chapter 1. Go to John chapter 1. John chapter 1, verses 1 through 5. What was that B word we just read back there in Revelation 3.14? It was beginning. Okay, it says here, In the beginning was the Word, and the Word was with God, and the Word was God. In the beginning. The same was in the beginning with God. All things were made by Him, and without Him was not anything made that was made. In Him was life, and the life was the light of men. And the light shineth in darkness, and the darkness comprehended it not. Who is the Word? Look over at uh, verse 14. And the Word, capital W, that only appears seven times in your King James Bible, the capital W Word. And the Word was made flesh and dwelt among us, and we beheld His glory, the glory as of the only begotten of the Father. God gave His only begotten Son only begotten, full of grace and truth. Who's it a reference to? The Lord Jesus Christ. Wait a second. All things were made by Him. If He's a created being, how could He make all things? Hmm? And why would He be called God? The Word was with God, and the Word was God. Did God create Himself? No. God didn't create Himself. Jesus Christ is God and always was God. You see, stupid little Richling has this system where he has God at first. I guess it's God and the Holy Spirit, so it's, it's, a, it's not a trinity. It's a, a, a duality or something. I don't even know what you'd call it. It's just two. And then God creates Jesus Christ on the first day of creation. But how did that work? Because the Bible said all things are created by Him, the Word. And the Word was God, was with God. The Word was manifested and dwelt among men. It's Jesus Christ. Jesus was not created Incredible. First Timothy three sixteen. First Timothy three sixteen. And without controversy, great is the mystery of godliness. God was manifest in the flesh, justified in the spirit, seen of angels, preached unto the Gentiles, believed on in the world, received up into glory. 
God was manifest in the flesh. And of course, the little rich thing goes, you know, Jesus is God now, but he wasn't at the beginning because at the beginning he was created. This guy's mentally sick. If you haven't figured that out yet, he's mentally sick. You'll, you know, I've, I've been trying to watch some of this guy's videos and stuff, and I'm going to be bringing out even more information on this loser. And he takes things and he twists it and tweaks it and, and it makes somebody say something that they never even said. Okay? He's got some problems up here. Some big problems. Jesus Christ is God and always was God. Isaiah 63. Come back in your Old Testament to Isaiah 63. Isaiah 63, verse 16. Doubtless thou art our father, though Abraham be ignorant of us, and Israel acknowledge us, acknowledge us not. Thou, O Lord, art our father, our Redeemer, thy name is from everlasting. God's name is from everlasting. You say, well, that's God the Father. That's not Jesus Christ, because Jesus is the Son. So God's everlasting, but Jesus is not, because he was created on the first day. Right? Let's continue. Micah. Micah 5.2. Micah 5, 2. But thou, Bethlehem Ephrata, though thou be little among the thousands of Judah, yet out of thee shall he come forth unto me that is to be ruler in Israel, whose goings forth have been from of old from the first day of creation. No, it says from everlasting. You say, oh, that's a reference to God. God's not going to be the one physically here on the earth just as himself without Jesus Christ. Okay, Jesus Christ, the Son, is the one unto whom this world is to be given as an inheritance. So you have back there in Isaiah 63, 16, it says God is from everlasting. Here in Micah 5, 2, it says that Jesus Christ, the one that's going to rule over the people of Israel there, the ruler in Israel for the millennial kingdom, Jesus Christ, his origins are from old, from everlasting. What does that mean? God and Jesus are one and the same. Jesus was not created. You say, well, you know, these are shaky scriptures. We're not done yet. Hebrews chapter 7. Hebrews chapter 7, verses 1 through 3. For this Melchizedek, king of Salem, priest of the Most High God, who met Abraham returning from the slaughter of the kings, and blessed him, to whom also Abraham gave a tenth part of all, first being by interpretation king of righteousness, and after that also king of Salem, which is king of peace. Without father, without mother, without descent, having neither beginning of days nor end of life, but made like unto the Son of God, abideth a priest continually. Having neither beginning of days? Well, if he was created, he would have a beginning of days, wouldn't he? No, you see, he's from everlasting. In the beginning was the Word, and the Word was with God, and the Word was God. All things were created by him. Who's the Him? The Word, Jesus Christ. He is the beginning of the creation of God. He was there. He is God. Therefore, He is the beginning of what was created. He is the one who was there and He created all things. He is the beginning. He's the one that started the creation. By his power, he created everything out there. It's insane that this guy would even believe this. Revelation chapter 1. Revelation 
Revelation chapter 1, verse 4 through 8. John to the seven churches which are in Asia, grace be unto you, and peace from him which is and which was and which is to come, and from the seven spirits which are before his throne, and from Jesus Christ who is the faithful witness and the first begotten of the dead and the prince of the kings of the earth, unto him that loved us and washed us from our sins in his own blood and hath made us kings and priests unto God and his Father, to him be glory and dominion for ever and amen, ever. Amen. Behold, he cometh with clouds, and every eye shall see him, and they also which pierced him, and all kindreds of the earth shall wail because of him. Even so, amen. I am Alpha and Omega, the beginning and the ending, saith the Lord, which is and which was and which is to come, the Almighty. Alpha and Omega. Which is, which was, and is to come. He's eternal. There's no point in time when Jesus Christ did not exist. If you go back into eternity past, before the world was created, it wasn't this two-pronged thing, you know, God and the Holy Spirit, and there's nothing else there. Jesus Christ was there the whole time. At least the Jesus Christ that we Christians know. As a lost man there, as a lost little devil, Richling, you don't know the Jesus Christ of the King James Bible. The one that's written about here in these pages. The one whose origins are from everlasting. You don't know Him. I don't know who your Christ is. Probably the Antichrist. But, uh, Colossians 1, Colossians 1, verse 12 through 17, giving thanks unto the Father which hath made us to be partakers of the inheritance of the saints in light, who hath delivered us from the power of darkness, and hath translated us into the kingdom of his dear Son, in whom we have redemption through his blood, even the forgiveness of sins who is the image of the invisible God, the firstborn of every creature. Well, why would he be the firstborn of every creature? Because he was there in the beginning before anything was created. Verse 16, For by him were all things created that are in heaven and that are in earth, visible and invisible, whether they be thrones or dominions or principalities or powers, all things were created by him and for him, and he is before all things, and by him all things consist. Wait a second. If all things are created by Jesus Christ, how could he then be created? Hello? Am I getting through the thick skull there, Martin? Or are the devils so powerful, have they taken over so much of your mind that you're not able to capable, not even capable to think anymore? That could be the, 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 what's really going on there. I mean, Jesus Christ said, Have not I chosen you twelve, and one of you is a devil? Speaking of Judas Iscariot, you know, maybe Martin Richling is just a devil that walks around on the earth. Maybe he's just so filled with devils that there's nothing even home up here anymore. i got to wonder about that guy. It's incredible. All things are created by Jesus Christ. Everything. How can you do that if you yourself are created? It doesn't work. And it says there, He is before all things. But He was created. Okay. Ridiculous. But, he, but, you know, then they'll say, but Jesus said that God the Father is greater. See? So that means that he is, you know, Jesus you know, said that and God the Father is greater. Let's look about that. John chapter 14, verse 28. And I'm going to get a little bit ticked off in this video because you're attacking the Lord and Savior Jesus Christ. Okay? You're putting down my Savior. So the gloves are off, pal. You're not my pal, actually. I'm sorry. I take that back. I apologize. I repent. You're not my pal. You're my enemy. All right. Martin Richling is the enemy. 
He's a very, very, very wicked man. Extremely wicked. That's why if you watch the guy, you know, the Bible talks about in John chapter 10, that this, the voice of a stranger, the sheep don't hear it. They're just like, whoa, uh, you know, get away from me. That's why you go to Martin Richling's channel and it's just like, ugh, ugh, man, this guy's horrible. Why? He's not saved. He's not a Christian. He's a devil. He's a very wicked devil. John 14, verse 28. Ye have heard how I said unto you, I go away and come again unto you. If ye loved me, ye would re rejoice, because I said I go unto the Father, for my Father is greater than I. Was God the Father greater than Jesus Christ? There, in that passage. Yes. You say, why? Well, let me explain something. The Godhead is made up of three. You got that? Body, soul, spirit. Now, the Bible says that we also have a body, soul, spirit. That doesn't mean that we are gods. It doesn't mean that we are like God as far as I'm on his level. Not even close. Not even infinitesimally close. I mean, we're talking... But we have a body, soul, and spirit. Now, let me ask you a question. The Trinity, the Godhead, who's the spirit? The Holy Ghost. Who's the soul? God the Father. Who's the body? Jesus Christ. Now let's compare it to me. What's the spirit in me? The Holy Ghost, in spite of what Martin Richling thinks. What's the soul? The part of me that's eternal. Okay? You can't see my soul right now. What's my body? What you're looking at. Is my soul greater than my body of flesh? Uh-huh. Let me show you something. See that? Cutting myself there, working and stuff around the place, you know, and there I was outside and I fell down in the ice and, and scraped my hand up and everything. Well, that really hurt when I cut my soul. Uh, I didn't cut my soul. You know why? Because my soul is within the body. So my soul is superior to my body, to my flesh. Well, then that means my soul and my spirit, or my, my flesh, are two different things. No, it doesn't. It just simply means in this life, with this corruptible flesh, my soul is superior. My soul is greater than my flesh. That's what Jesus Christ was saying. It wasn't that Jesus Christ is saying, I am somehow under God the Father, and He's so much greater than I, I can't even, you know, I, I'm not even on His level. That's not what's going on there. Jesus Christ is saying simply, you don't understand the fact that my Father, the soul that's in me, you don't understand the fact because you're looking at my body of flesh. You're looking, I don't know, Jesus might have had scars from, you know, carpentry accidents or things or whatever. Uh, he might have been dirty at the time of talking to him. I don't know. Why? His flesh was corruptible, just like our flesh is corruptible. Now, he was the only one that ever lived in the flesh and did not sin. That's true. Okay? I can't say that about myself. Nobody can say that about themselves as a saved Christian. But his flesh was still corruptible. When he died on the cross, he felt it. When they whipped him, when they beat him, there was blood that came out. When they nailed the, the, the nails through his hands, it didn't just kind of boing, bounce off or something like that. It was corruptible. But guess what? The soul didn't feel that. If you hurt your flesh, if you cut your flesh or, or get beat or something like that, your body feels it. Your soul doesn't. So in that sense, yes, your soul is greater than your flesh. See? That's all that's going on there in that passage. Jesus is not saying, I'm the created being and God the Father is the one that created me. That's not what Jesus Christ is saying there. And I'm going to show you proof. Look over at verse 6, there in John chapter 14. Jesus saith unto him, I am the way, the truth, and the life. No man cometh unto the Father, but by me. If ye had known me, ye should have known my Father also, and from henceforth ye know him, and have seen him. He's standing right in front of them. Now look at their response. Philip saith unto him, Lord, show us the Father, and it sufficeth us. 
Jesus saith unto him, Have I been so long time with you, and yet hast thou not known me, Philip? He that hath seen me hath seen the Father. And how sayest thou then, Show us the Father? Believest thou not that I am in the Father, and the Father in me? The words that I speak unto you I speak not of myself, but the Father that dwelleth in me, he doeth the works. He that hath seen me hath seen Brian Denninger. You've never seen Brian Denninger. You say, I've seen you right now. No, you're not. You're seeing my body. But you don't see the soul. See, you shoot this body, and I go down and I'm laying there, you know, dead like that. Uh, all you're going to see is the body. And you leave that body there long enough, it's going to rot, it's going to stink. All right? But the soul's gone. You can do whatever you want to this body. You can't do, do anything to my soul. You can't mess with my soul. Why? It's eternal. You see? You know? And the spirit, the breath that's in me, and the Holy Spirit that's dwelling in me, that spirit, put your hand up and I'm laying there dead. Put your hand up there. There's no more breath coming out. The spirit leaves. The soul leaves. The body's there. See? That's what's going on there. But the fact is, God the Father was dwelling bodily in Jesus Christ. And it was always that way. You see, if you'd have gone to heaven back there in the Old Testament before Jesus Christ came down to the earth, you would have seen a form like the Son of God. See? You would have seen some kind of form there. It would have been a body. Jesus Christ there in the flesh. All right? You would not have seen this glowing, this kind of a glowing thing there or something like that. Ah, uh, you wouldn't have seen that. You'd have seen a man sitting there. That's why Abraham saw this priest after the order of Melchizedek. He saw him. Nebuchadnezzar throws the three guys into the fire, Shadrach, Meshach, and Abednego, and he says, there's four in there, and one is like unto the Son of God. Why? It's a pre-incarnate Christ. The angel of the Lord, back in the Old Testament, many times appeared on the earth as a pre-incarnation of Jesus Christ. That's what's going on there. Why? Jesus Christ has always been. He is the third part of the Godhead. It was not two in the beginning and then one was created. That's heresy. That's satanic heresy. Jesus Christ has been from everlasting. He was there in the beginning of the creation of God. He himself is not created, but he was there in the beginning. All things are made by him. Nothing came before him. It was all made by the Lord Jesus Christ. John 8. John 8. Verse 56 here. Jesus makes a very interesting statement here. It says here, Your father Abraham rejoiced to see my day, and he saw it, and was glad. Then said the Jews unto him, Thou art not yet fifty years old, and hast thou seen Abraham? Jesus said unto them, Verily, verily, I say unto you, Now look at this, Before Abraham was, I am. What was their reaction? Then took they up stones to cast at him, but Jesus hid himself, and went out of the temple, going through the midst of them, and so passed by. Why'd they get so upset? Because Jesus spoke a title that it belongs to only God the Father in eternity. You see, the only statement that an eternal being can make is, I am. You say, where were you at in the past? I am. Where are you at right now? I am. Where are you going to be in the future? I am. That's the only statement that an eternal being could make. Why? It's present tense the whole way through. He always was there. Jesus Christ here is saying that he was there at the beginning. That he was there in everlasting. You see, you can't say, Brian Denninger, where were you in 1826? I can't say, I am. I can't do that. I wasn't back there. You say, where were you in 1975? Well, 
I was born in Lancaster County, Pennsylvania. I am from Pennsylvania. You say, how about uh, 1775? No, it wasn't there. See? I was created by God in 1975. I wasn't created before then. So you can't say, I can't make the, the, all, the, the statement there, I am, and have it refer to all of eternity. I am not the Alpha and Omega. I am not the beginning and the ending. I was not the with, word that was with God and was God. I am not any of those things. Only one man can say that, and that's the Lord Jesus Christ who Martin Richling professes to know, but yet obviously in his words he denies. Turn to Exodus chapter 3. I'll show you this thing. It's tie in here with God, the Father. Exodus chapter 3. Exodus 3, verse 6. It says here, Moreover, he said, I am the God of thy father, the God of Abraham, the God of Isaac, and the God of Jacob. And Moses hid his face, for he was afraid to look upon God. He said, I am. But look at verse 14. And God said unto Moses, I am that I am. And he said, Thus shalt thou say unto the children of Israel, I am hath sent me unto you. That's a very holy title of God. Very holy. That's why a lot of the new versions will change it. They'll say, I am what I am, or something, or I am who I am, or something like that. Uh, that don't cut it. I am that I am. That's the statement of somebody who has existed for all of eternity. And the Lord Jesus Christ made the statement in the New Testament, and just so you know that it wasn't just him saying, well, I am, you know, Jesus. Just so you know that that's not what happened there. The Bible records that the Jews were so mad that they took up stones to throw them at it. Why? Because he made himself the everlasting God with that one statement. Two little words. I am. Three letters. Jesus Christ is the everlasting God. Jesus Christ was not created. A couple more places to turn to here. 1 John chapter 5. John chapter 5, verse 6 and 7. This is he that came by water and blood, even Jesus Christ, not by water only, but by water and blood. And it is the Spirit that beareth witness, because the Spirit is truth. Like John 14, verse 6. For there are three that bear record in heaven, the Father, the Word. In the beginning was the Word, and the Word was with God, and the Word was God. All things were created by him, the Word. There are three that bear record in heaven, the Father, the Word, and the Holy Ghost. And these three are one. Wait, no, it, actually 1 John 5, 7, the Johannine comma, actually should be better translated this way, um, if you're stupid richling. For there are three that bear record in heaven, the Father, the Word, and the Holy Ghost, and these three are one today, but they weren't at the beginning of the creation because then it was only the Father and the Holy Ghost and Jesus the Word had to be created at some later point in time. The first day of creation was Jesus created. That's not what the Bible says. Jesus Christ is God and always has been and always will be. In spite of what some devil tries to say. Acts 20, verse 28. Let me show you the importance of this whole thing. Acts 20, verse 28. Take heed, therefore, unto yourselves and to all the flock over the which the Holy Ghost hath made you overseers to feed the church of God, which he hath purchased with his own blood. If you believe that Jesus Christ, if your Jesus 
is a created being that was not God in the beginning of the creation of the world. If that's your Jesus, then you believe a false Christ. You do not believe in the Lord Jesus Christ of the King James Bible. It's written about right here in these pages. You don't believe in Jesus. And Mark Richling, you don't believe in the Jesus Christ of the Bible. You believe in a created Christ. Interesting because the Antichrist is created. That's who you really believe in. That's who you really serve. The blood of Jesus Christ, that blood would mean nothing if Jesus was created. It would mean absolutely nothing. The reason that it redeems from sin, the reason that it's saved from hell, is because it's God's eternal blood. Eternal. Not created. Let's end with some scriptures here. Two, little, two more scriptures to go to. 2 Corinthians chapter 11. Talked about this in the other study, but we're going to hit it one more time. For good measure. 2 Corinthians chapter 11 verse 3. But I fear lest by any means as the serpent beguiled Eve through his subtlety, so your mind should be corrupted from the simplicity that is in Christ. For if he that cometh preacheth another Jesus, like one that's created, Martin Richling is preaching another Jesus, whom we have not preached, or if you receive another spirit, Watch Martin Richling for five minutes. If you can even stomach that long, he has another spirit in him. It's disgusting. It's like taking a swim through a cesspool watching this guy's videos. It's, it's, it's just vile. Oh, it's, it's, it's gross. It's just it's horrible. This guy has another spirit. He has another Jesus. His Jesus is created. He has another spirit. Now look at this, which ye have not received, or another gospel. He tells you you don't have to pray. Only believe. Only believe. Well, then I guess everybody that believes in Jesus is saved automatically, huh? See? He qualifies for all three. He preaches another Jesus. He has another spirit. And he is preaching another gospel. And you know what? It says there, ye might well bear with him. If you're very, very weak in the faith, maybe a novice, and you hear this guy and you are deceived enough to actually listen to him and actually start believing him, then you're about as dumb and carnal as those Corinthian believers. But let me just finish up here with one more little rebuke. Galatians chapter 1. Galatians chapter 1, verse 6. This is to some of the people out there that actually follow Martin Richling. And it's to Martin Richling as well. I marvel that ye are so soon removed from him that called you into the grace of Christ unto another gospel, which is not another. In other words, it's not somebody you pray to Muhammad or Buddha or something. It's a perversion of true biblical Christianity. Exactly the way Satan would do it. Which is not another, but there be some that trouble you Watch Martin Richling's videos and see how quickly he troubles you. See how quickly he tells you the Romans road is the road to hell and all this other stuff. You're not really saved. You're this, you're that, you're this, you know. He'll trouble you. And would pervert the gospel of Christ. But though we or an angel from heaven preach any other gospel unto you than that which we have preached unto you, let him be accursed. As we said before, so say I now again, if any man preach any other gospel unto you than that ye have received, let him be accursed. May the Lord Jesus Christ rebuke thee, thou wicked Martin Richling. How dare you attack Jesus Christ and say he was created? How dare you? If you don't repent quickly... If you even can, you devil. If you don't repent quickly, God's wrath is going to come upon you and upon your house. You can attack me all you want. You can put down Brian Denlinger. You can put down King James Video Ministries. You can put down those who watch this channel. 
You can put us down all you want, but you don't put down Jesus Christ. You don't go out there and say that He is a created being, you wicked devil, you. I am going to pray that the Lord shuts down your wicked ministry. And let me tell you something there, devil. Your lies, your deception are starting to fall apart. We're starting to see through your little game. We're starting to see that you are the one that teaches work salvation, saying that you need to you have to continually be justified. We see that you said that Peter was without error. That he never made a mistake. Just like a papist would. And I have also seen in your teachings that you believe that you are perfect in your doctrines. Papal infallibility. You papist. You devil. May the Lord rebuke thee, Martin Richling. Alright, I want to talk to you real quick here about Martin Richling's uh, delusional, paranoid beliefs that he is... Uh, speaking ex cathedra, you know, that he is perfect and infallible. He doesn't come right out and say it, but he very strongly implies it. I'm going to show you some of this. Now, I said in my video, my, my one video rebuking him, I said that I'm not perfect. Now, if you followed the ministry, you know that. <laughs> I mess up sometimes. I, I make mistakes. I've corrected myself. I've had to correct myself. That's just what any preacher is going to do. Real preacher. Okay? But now, if you understand Catholicism, you understand they believe in the infallibility of the church. And they believe that their priests are other Christs. And that the Pope is the vicar of Christ. He is Jesus Christ manifest on the earth. They call him the Holy Father, which is God's title. So you see, in Catholicism, which Richling you know, said that he wanted to be a Jesuit priest when he grew up, you know, when he was a boy, and I think he made it, but uh, in Catholicism they teach the infallibility of a of the pope when he's speaking ex cathedra okay and they teach that the priest is another christ so let's watch a couple video clips here of martin richling and i'm going to show you that he is a papist watch this when a preacher is preaching the word i am not the shepherd of the sheep in terms of on the same level as jesus christ He's not on the... Now, this shows you, for anyone interested, mostly our church and other faithful believers will get this. He's going to say, he's not the good shepherd like Christ. He's under Christ. The issue today is Christ living through our flesh. Only real believers understand that that is God's eternal purpose in Ephesians 3. As Jesus Christ, as we're conformed to the image of God's Son... As God's Son lives his literal life through our flesh. That's who lived through Paul. Hmm. So Christ lives his literal life through our flesh? Really? Oh, well, we're going to see about that as we continue. But let me just show you something here from the Catholic Catechism. It says here, Christ, our high priest in heaven, the priest on earth, another Christ. Now, if Christ is living his literal life, life through your flesh, then that would mean you're another Christ, wouldn't it? Not just a Christian, but another Christ. Then you would have to be sinlessly perfect in your flesh. Do you get it? Let's watch another clip here from Martin Satanist Richling. This isn't looking at what Christ did and being like Jesus. Like Brian's going to now describe unto you. All right, Jesus Christ is perfect, I'm not. I'll make mistakes sometimes. Wait a minute. Jesus Christ is perfect, Brian Denlinger says I'm not. Well, that's true. But the issue, if Brian Denlinger was saved, is not Brian Denlinger living. The issue is Christ living through flesh. Do you want me to show you these passages? Or Because I probably should, because most of you Denlinger people don't even know they exist. 2 Corinthians 4, verse 10. Always bearing about in the body the dying of the Lord Jesus, that the life also of Jesus might be made manifest in our body. The life also of Jesus. That's real life. Manifest where? 
in our body. Verse 11, For we which live are always delivered unto death for Jesus' sake, that the life also of Jesus might be made manifest, where? In our mortal flesh. Now, is the life of Jesus going to be made manifest through your life as a Christian? Yeah, it will. But not through you teaching perfect doctrine, and through you having a perfectly sanctified body of flesh, like Jesus Christ had. That isn't true. What's going on there is the Lord Jesus Christ is saying, Hey, you know what? They hated me. They're going to hate you. Um, I was persecuted. You're going to be persecuted. I mean, look, look at the passage there. 2 Corinthians chapter 4, verse 8 and 9. We are troubled on every side, yet not distressed. We are perplexed, but not in despair. Persecuted, but not forsaken. Cast down, but not destroyed. Have you experienced that as a Christian? You say, yes, I have, actually. I've, I've been quite perplexed at people, their reactions to me trying to witness to them. You know, I've been troubled on every side. I've had times when, when things have been really bad because of my stance as a Christian, you know, um, but not in despair, you know, you know, that it's supposed to be this way. All these different things. What Jesus Christ went through on this earth, you're going to go through as a Christian. That's what's being said there. Not that you are going to somehow preach perfect doctrine and never be in error. And I'm going to show you as we continue here, he really lets something slip that proves that he's a papist. Let's keep watching. This is seeing the real, literal Jesus Christ manifested through flesh. That's why the Apostle Paul says, For to me, to live is Christ. Paul says, I'm living, you're seeing Christ. That's why he told the Ephesians, who had never seen Jesus Christ at all in his earthly ministry, he says in Ephesians chapter 4, verse 21, if so be that ye have heard him, he tells the saints at Ephesus, you heard Christ and have been taught by him, as the truth is in Jesus. When did the saints at Ephesus ever hear Christ, these Gentiles at Ephesus? When were they ever taught by Christ? Not during his earthly ministry, but by Christ in Paul, living through Paul's flesh. Whoo! Did you catch that? We can't hear from Jesus Christ, heaven coming down, teaching us through the word. Oh, no, 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 no. No, we have to have a priest class above us. They heard Christ and were taught by Christ through Paul. Holy Father Paul, you know. That's what this nut is teaching. That's exactly what he's trying to say here. He is trying to teach Roman Catholic doctrine that you need the holy ordained priesthood that teaches that does not teach error as long as we speak ex cathedra. That's what this guy's teaching. He is a papist. Totally a papist. And by the way, you say... But Paul had Christ speaking through his flesh. Really? Let's look at Romans chapter 7. Romans chapter 7. Find my place here. Romans chapter 7, verse 17. Paul writing, Now then it is no more I that do it, but sin that dwelleth in me. For I know that in me that is in my flesh dwelleth no good thing, for to will is present with me, but how to perform that which is good I find not. For the good that I would, I do not, but the evil which I would not, that I do. Now if I do that, what, now if I do that, I would not, it is no more I that do it, but sin that dwelleth in me. Um, I thought Christ was dwelling in his flesh and that he was Christ walking around on the earth. Well, then why would he say, in my flesh there dwelleth no good thing if he is Christ's physical representative on the earth in terms of being perfect and pure in his doctrine and never being wrong? How could you make a statement like that? Unless you're a papist, you see. You see, the truth is, dear friend, you have access, direct access, to the Lord Jesus Christ in heaven, and He can teach you His Word through the power of the Holy Ghost, through the Scriptures. That's why you'll never see me pointing to myself and saying, I am Christ to you. 
and you must obey and listen to everything that I say because I am perfect in doctrine. I would never utter such blasphemous words in seriousness. Okay, I said it there just as a joke. But the fact is, I wouldn't say that thing like that. Good night, man. You know what's perfect? The book. The book. The book. The book. This is where you go to. That's why I've had, I've had brothers, I've had sisters, I've had women, saved women, that have said, Hey, Brother Brian, I don't mean to usurp, usurp your authority or whatever, but you said such and such, and doesn't the Bible say this? And I've gone, Oh, man, I can't believe I messed up. I can be corrected by the body of Christ through the Word. The perfect standard is here. It's not here. And it never will be here. And some of you that put ministries and preachers up on a pedestal and think that they're perfect, and all of a sudden, it won't take long and you'll realize they're not perfect. And then your little idol will fall down and you'll go, Oh, no, what do I do now? Uh, probably should stick with the book, you know? Continue. He doesn't preach 100% pure, perfect doctrine. Really. You are to be uncorruptible when it comes to doctrine. No corruptness. You are to be perfect, Paul said. Blameless. Okay, you are to manifest forth the life of Jesus Christ. And if Christ was living through your flesh, Brian, he would be teaching doctrine perfectly. You are to be sincere and without offense till the day of Christ, Paul told the Philippians. So if Christ was living in me, I would preach perfectly. Okay, I know you're watching this there, Marty. Let me ask you a question, and I want you to write it in the comments for everybody to see. Don't be a little coward and go make a little video of 45 minutes of playing two seconds of Brian Denninger and then pausing it and going, hee 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 and making your stupid little comments. Put it down in the comments section where you can't block other people from rebuking you, you know? Put it down there for the whole world to see. Do you teach perfect doctrine? Do you, Martin Richling, teach 100% pure, perfect doctrine? Write it in the comments, please. You say, well, let's, let's have a debate. No, 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 we don't, we don't need to do that, okay? Write it in the comments. I want it in writing so the whole world can see it. He can make mistakes, and that's what flesh does. But Christ doesn't make mistakes, and Christ lives again through flesh like he lived through Paul. You just got to follow Paul and follow the establishment commandment, which you, don't, which you mock later on. Keep going. Ooh. Did you see a little thing there to himself? You just got to follow Paul and the establishment commandment that I've never heard anybody else preach except for old Marty here. You would be perfect if you followed... The Establishment Commandment? Again, I ask, Martin Richling, are you perfect in your doctrinal stands? Because I've already proved that you aren't because you teach that Jesus Christ was a created being and, and that's not true from Scripture. I've proved it over and over and over again. Please comment. Okay? This watching over the flock that the Lord, it isn't the Lord God Almighty or the Lord Jesus Christ who has given you anything, Brian. These are deceived, blind dolts who you simply, we're going to see, are feeding and are feeding trash unto. So all of you that uh, have seen my videos and have watched my videos, that's all just trash that I've fed unto you. I guess this book is trash then because I read from it a lot in my teaching and preaching. But uh, he called you deceived dolts. Okay? That's why he's afraid to allow comments on his videos from you deceived dolts. See, again, the cult mentality here. He thinks that all of you worship me. You're all Denlingerites or something like that. No, you're not. You people all have your own mind. Like I said, some of you disagree with me vehemently on a couple of issues. And yet we can still stay in fellowship. We can still respect one another. And I do respect a lot of you, even some of those of you that go to the church building thing and we've had disagreements on that and stuff. Hey, there are some of you I respect very highly. I'll be very honest with you. I don't agree with you 100%, but I do respect many of you. Okay? But you see, little hireling here, little uh, richling, 
he's saying, you're all deceived dolts. All right. Then put your comments, your brave little comments, down in the comment section, and the deceived dolts are going to write to you. You aren't afraid, are you? They're not going to get it. What did he tell Peter after he was, you know, ascended up from, you know, raised from the dead? He said, feed my sheep. That's my job. I'm he just compared himself to Peter. He said, feed my sheep. Well, it had been a better, you should have followed Paul. Okay? Peter then was filled with the Holy Ghost in Acts 2. Peter wasn't preaching errors and mistakes. Ho, ho, ho. Uh oh. Peter wasn't preaching errors and mistakes because he was filled with the Holy Ghost. Uh oh. You know, one of the ways that you can scare an animal out of the bush is to whack the bush and it runs out. You know one of the ways that you can get a Catholic to run out of their cover, to run out of the bush, so to speak? Start whacking their little pet doc doctrines, little things that are sacred to a Catholic. Who's the first pope according to Catholicism? The Apostle Peter. <laughs> He's the one that the church was founded upon, the rock that the church was founded upon. Yeah, Jesus Christ is the rock. Okay, that the church is founded upon. Other foundation can no man lay than that which is laid, which is Christ Jesus. Jesus Christ is the rock, not Peter. But you see, Catholics will get all upset when you kick Mary, when you kick Peter. And I don't mean kicking them saying that they're lost or anything. No, I don't mean that. But what I'm saying is when you bring them down to the level of the average Christian, oh boy, and you saw Richling just get upset there. He compares himself to Peter. You should compare yourself to Paul, which I do. You've seen that in other studies, if you know anything about the ministry. But he gets all upset because I compare myself to Peter. And then he says, Peter doesn't teach error. He never made mistakes or taught error. Which is Catholic doctrine, by the way. Galatians chapter 2, verse 11. But when Peter was come to Antioch, I withstood him to the face, because he was to be blamed... For before that certain came from James, he did eat with the Gentiles, but when they were come, he withdrew himself, or withdrew and separated himself, fearing them which were of the circumcision. And the other Jews dissembled likewise with him, insomuch that Barnabas also was carried away with their dissimulation. Okay? Then you say, that was just in practice. Peter just did that in practice. He, that wasn't doctrine that he was teaching. Let's continue. Verse 14, But when I saw that they walked not uprightly according to the truth of the gospel, I said unto Peter before them all, If thou, being a Jew, livest after the manner of Gentiles, and not as do the Jews, why compellest thou the Gentiles to live as do the Jews? We who are Jews by nature and not sinners of the Gentiles, knowing that a man is not justified by the works of the law, but by the faith of Jesus Christ, even we have believed in Jesus Christ that we might be justified by the faith of Christ and not by the works of the law, for by the works of the law shall no flesh be justified. Was Peter in error? Was he teaching error? Yes. Peter was in error. He was not the infallible Pope of the Catholics. Okay? The first Pope there, the Peter, is a figment of Catholic imagination. He doesn't exist in Scripture. The real Peter in Scripture made mistakes, just like anybody makes mistakes, including the Apostle Paul. Yes, we are to have Christ's life living through us. Yes, sir, we are supposed to be Christ's representatives on earth. But if you haven't realized by now that Christians make mistakes and struggle with their flesh, you are either very, very green, a very extreme novice Christian that hasn't been around very much, or you're not saved, okay? Christians make mistakes. We're not perfect. Unless you're richling, you know, then in your little mind you think that you're a perfect Jesuit priest. <laughs> Excuse me, I meant Catholic. Uh, oh, Christian. Sorry. Everyone in our church just reads the Bible. We're all like-minded. They all see the same thing that is that I see, that it's right there being taught, simple as can be, because they read 
the scriptures. <laughs> oh boy, yeah. Everybody in my church believes the way I do. Yes, that's the definition of a cult. You say, well, all Christians are supposed to agree. We're supposed to be 100% in agreement. Really? Acts chapter 15, verse 37. And Barnabas determined to take with them John, whose surname was Mark. But Paul thought, thought not good to take him with them, who departed from them from Pamphylia, and went not with them to the work. And the contention was so sharp between them that they departed asunder one from the other, and so Barnabas took Mark and sailed unto Cyprus, and Paul chose Silas and departed, being recommended by the brethren under the grace of God. And he went through Syria and Cilicia, confirming the churches. Wait a second, they were supposed to be in a 100% agreement. There was not supposed to be any disagreements between them. But there was. And yet both men were still filled with the Holy Ghost. Huh? Really? Sure. And it wasn't just a matter of personality. Paul had reasons for not wanting to have Mark come with him. This, this cultic mindset, and, and, I mean, this Mark Richling guy is, is one of the most cultish uh, people I've ever seen. Okay? I mean, he believes that he has got the answers. He is perfect, with infallible in his doctrine. And, you know, apparently nobody else is. And so I, I just want to end here, because I'm going to get into some other videos here with showing Martin Richling's hypocrisy. But uh, let me just ask a couple questions. And again, there, Martin, I know you're watching. Put your comments down here in the comments section, okay? For my deceived dolts. You know, the people that watch this ministry, I'd like them to be able to refute you. Okay, since they're all deceived, it shouldn't be too hard for you. But let me ask you a couple questions. Number one, are your doctrinal stands, all your doctrine, doctrinal preaching, is it perfect? Is it 100% pure and perfect? That's the first question. Okay. Secondly, let me ask you this. Do you believe that Peter never spoke doctrinal error. Okay? How about that one? Okay, thirdly, forgot what it was there. I had to go back and watch the video again, and I remembered a lot of other things on my mind right now. Thirdly, let me ask you a question there, Martin Richling. Uh, 2 Timothy chapter 2, verse 1 and 2 says, Thou therefore, my son, be strong in the grace that is in Christ Jesus, and the things that thou hast heard of me among many witnesses, the same commit thou to faithful men who shall be able to teach others also. We're not supposed to learn from just one person. So let me ask you a question there, Martin Richling. Could you give us uh, some other ministries that are good and that preach the way that you preach? I mean, because, you know, if it's just you, you're the only one who's a real, legitimate, perfect preacher on the earth, um, you know, that would be kind of a cultic. You know? So uh, I'd like you to answer those three questions. Okay? Please give us another ministry that preaches the way that you preach that we could rely on for perfect doctrine, if that is what you believe. Put the comments down there, I want to see them. Alright, now I'm going to show you some video clips where Martin Richling actually is teaching works salvation and not only that but you have to die in a state of grace now he doesn't come right out and say it that way but he says that you have to keep your salvation you have to keep you know being justified up until the time that you die he denies eternal security right here and if you deny eternal security well how do you stay saved by your works so he makes all this big this big stink about, oh, you know, people that, that say a prayer of salvation, that's work salvation. And he himself is teaching work salvation. Let's watch a video clip here. He's, he's, he's not even going to explain it right. But when he, Paul says this gospel by which you are also saved, remember the Corinthians' trouble. It wasn't believing in Jesus. Paul says in 1 Corinthians 1 that their testimony was confirmed by all utterance and all knowledge. 
He, they said, man, your testimony is confirmed. You're the church of God at Corinth. Their problem was service. Fornication, suing each other, messing up the sign gifts, messing up the Lord's Supper, divisions among them. Horrible things they were doing in the flesh. So they were not walking from Romans 5 truth forward, but because Paul's gospel is glad tidings of good things, they weren't being dead to sin, dead to the law, and the total victory that Romans 8 gives. So he just said that the Corinthians were saved when Paul confirmed the word, you know, and everything there at the beginning. They're saved, but they're just having problems. They're not walking in that you know, thing there, the sanctification, or they're not walking in it. Um, isn't walking a work? You say, well, Brian, he's not teaching anything. Let's continue watching. Believed in vain. Yeah, you know what that means? It means exactly that. If you don't keep in memory what Paul preached, your time past belief is in vain. God does not care what you believed in the past. God cares what you believe now. Your salvation is always in the present tense. Being justified freely by His grace. Romans 5.1 then. Therefore, being justified by faith, we have peace with God through our Lord Jesus Christ. Being justified. It's in the present tense. So he says, believed in vain here. That To believe is just in vain. <laughs> Did you get that? Your salvation is always in the present tense, then it's not finished. Did you get that? This man is teaching works salvation. You know what you do when you go to a Roman Catholic? You say, are you saved? You know what they're supposed to say? It's in the Catechism. They're supposed to say, I am being saved. Why? They have to continue in a state of grace. They have to go to confession. They have to do penance. Why? To merit salvation. This guy's a papist, I'm telling you. He is a Jesuit. I can almost guarantee you. And you say, well, Brian, can you prove it? I cannot prove it in the sense of getting a picture there, you know, with his paper saying, hello, I'm a Jesuit. You can't prove it like that. But the fact of the matter is, what he is preaching is Roman Catholicism. Now, it's veiled, okay? He's trying to look like he's a King James Bible believer, but he starts to come out with stuff like this, and you can see, whoa, wait a second here. This isn't Bible. This is Catholicism. That's what this guy's teaching. And you're going to see later on him saying about, you have to die in this good state. That's Catholic. Dying in a state of grace. But let's look at Romans chapter 5, verse 1. It says, Therefore, being justified by faith, we have peace with God through our Lord Jesus Christ by whom also we have access by faith into this grace wherein we stand and rejoice in hope of the glory of God. Wherein we stand? Um, and by the way, being justified by faith, is that a continuous event or is that once and done? Um, that's once and done. You don't have to believe by faith that Jesus died for your sins every day to stay saved. That's Catholic. That is works. By definition, that is works. This guy, this nut is teaching works salvation. It's incredible. You must continue. It's always present tense. Incredible. Let's continue watching here. No, now see, now he's lumping me in with the other heretics who say once saved, always saved. Ooh. Oh, I'm lumping him in with other heretics that say once saved, always saved like the Bible teaches. Oh, you reckon old uh, Martin Richling isn't really a Bible-believing Christian after all? Could it be that he's a Catholic? A Papist? Perhaps a Jesuit? <laughs> That's conspiratorial, man! Come on! Uh-huh. There is eternal security for the believer. In the present state, I have eternal security. If I died right now to be absent from the bodies, to be present with the Lord. I have eternal security. I, I'm sealed unto the day of redemption. All the verses on eternal security apply to a believer. But if you do not keep salvation and what Paul preached in your memory, your time past belief is in vain. 
Do you understand? It is in vain. you got to die like Paul died. I have kept the faith. Paul died a believer. You cast off your faith, believe another gospel, believe in Muhammad, the Pope, God. You're not a believer. So all the verses on eternal security don't apply to you because you're not a believer. They only apply to believers. Oh, you have to die a believer. Die in a state of grace. If you die as a faithful Catholic, well, you might make it if you go through purgatory for a while. Give old Richling here some time, he'll probably be teaching purgatory. If he doesn't already, and I haven't heard all of his studies, I wouldn't possibly waste my time like that. But you say, well, you have to continue believing up until the time you die. Really? Um, so let's look at 2 Timothy chapter 2. Verse 11, it is a faithful saying, for if we be dead with him, we shall also live with him. If we suffer, we shall also reign with him. If we deny him, he also will deny us. Oh, then he denies your salvation, right? No, keep reading. If we believe not, yet he abideth faithful, he cannot deny himself. Once you are born again, you are a member of the body of Christ. You can't be unborn again. You can't become saved and then lost. When Jesus Christ casts people into hell, he says, Depart from me, ye cursed, I never knew you. He doesn't say, I knew you what one time and then you got lost because you stopped believing and then you got saved again and then you, you stopped believing again. And so you were in and out and in and out and unfortunately you died on, on one of the times when you were out. Huh? No, no. The reality of it is, when you get saved, you're in. You're a Christian. And you're going to go home to glory. Now, of course, Richling doesn't understand that because he's not a member of the body of Christ. He is a papist. He's teaching papal doctrines here. Okay? Just incredible. Now I could rebuke him, you know, as a, as a heretic, which he is, but I'm going to let him rebuke himself, actually. Let's watch some more videos here. When man can respond in a work, he's not offended. He's participating in his salvation and deeds. What Jesus did wasn't enough. So I have to then add a work. It's exactly what he believes. You see how twisted this guy is? He comes out and he's attacking people that pray to get saved. And in reality, what he's saying is exactly what he's teaching. Because you have to keep yourself saved. You have to stay saved. It's incredible. Die in a state of grace, you know. You have to die believing. Let's continue. But yet the stupid preachers come along today and give lost people a work to do. That's why so many thousands do it. Because it's not offensive. Do you understand? Your flesh will gobble up any work to do to please God. Man is incurably religious. From the garden, when he sinned, he covered himself with fig leaves. And fig leaves are always having to do something. Fig leaves are a work. It's a perfect illustration of what man man attempts to do to please God. The problem with fig leaves, though, is they dry up and you got to keep picking more. You see? you got to keep picking more. Kind of like saying that you, your salvation is always in the present tense and you got to keep believing, working your way to heaven. You see? Because lost people will do any work to please God. That way they can avoid the offense of the cross where God rejects all your works because Jesus Christ did all the work. All right. Jesus Christ did all the work, but you have to stay saved. You have to keep believing. Okay. Um, that doesn't work. All right. Martin Richling is a lost man. And let me just say this in conclusion here. I've made uh, four videos now uh, debunking this ridiculous idiot and uh, lost man. I don't know if I should call him an idiot because an idiot is somebody who is ignorant and oftentimes has no idea they're not capable of understanding more. And I don't think that that's Martin Richling. I believe that the man is a trained Jesuit um, 
I've showed you now documented proof that he is teaching uh, Roman Catholic doctrine. He taught that Peter was without error. He has taught that uh, he is without error, that we should be other Christs in our flesh. Uh, and here in this video, he is teaching that you have to die basically in a state of grace. You have to continue believing. Belief, it's being justified. That's what Catholics teach. A true Catholic, they, they say, if you say, I know I'm going to go to heaven when I die, they say that's the sin of presumption. Okay? That's what's going on. Catholicism is all about adding to what Jesus Christ did. And of course, they don't believe in what Jesus Christ did on the cross, because if they did, they wouldn't have to continually eat him and drink his blood in the Mass. See? Richling is a Catholic. He never got saved. He is teaching even something that most Catholics wouldn't teach, and that is that Jesus Christ is a created being. That is satanic. Even a devout Catholic, most devout Catholics don't even teach that. So this guy is lost. And you say, well, Brian, why are you giving this guy your time? Because I want to use him and his heresies to teach you out there. To teach you that just because somebody says that they believe the King James Bible and they read out of the King James Bible... That doesn't make them saved, and that does not make them a real true teacher of the King James Bible. And I'm going to tell you right now, this man is one of the most deceptive I've ever seen. You got a guy like Stephen Anderson, you know, he makes a lot of stupid mistakes and says a lot of stupid things that can easily be debunked. And, you know, some of the other guys that I've, you know, attacked uh, and exposed on this channel, um, they make some really stupid mistakes. And sometimes it's because they're a novice, sometimes it's because they're proud and they don't want to be corrected. Um, but Richling, uh, this guy, there's a spirit there that is very, very evil. Extremely evil. And uh, I have not experienced this level of evil before from a professing King James Bible-believing pastor. Uh, this guy is very, very bad. And that's why I thought I better make a couple videos exposing this guy, showing... You know, listening to this guy, I mean, I'm listening to him and, you know, doing my work and things, you know, around here and trying to fix things up and stuff and while I'm listening to this guy. And it just, just listening to him was making me feel mean and making me feel hateful. And just like, this guy doesn't know the first thing about the love of Christ. Why? He's never been redeemed. And so I'm going to tell you right now, I'm not going to waste any more time on this guy. I don't care what he's going to bring out against me in the future or whatever else. In fact, I'm probably going to ban him from my channel. I'm going to give him time to respond to these videos, you know. But I'm getting sick and tired of his, his silly little followers coming on here and putting links to his videos and stuff. My, video, my channel is not here to promote Martin Richling, okay. I'm making these videos to debunk a very seriously evil man. And, but I, I have so many other projects to do. You know, I'm going to get back to preaching the Word. You know, I know a lot of you have been like, don't even answer him, Brian. You know, and I appreciate that. But, uh, you know, I just wanted to make a couple videos showing the very serious nature of this guy and showing you, you know, some of you called me paranoid and stuff because I said I believe he's a Jesuit. Well, I still believe he's a Jesuit. I've been showing you doctrines that the guy is teaching that are from straight out of the Catholic Catechism. And I would, if I had my catechisms right now, they're, they're boxed away yet. If I had them right now, I would show you. Okay, watch some of my old, older videos. I did show these, you know, sections of the catechism where they are teaching papal infallibility. And where they are teaching you need to die in a state of grace and things like that. You can look that stuff up on your own, too. But, uh, just wanted to make this final video. I'm not going to make anything more on Martin Richling. Um, just because I can't stomach listening to the guy for very long. He's just... He is vile. He's a very, very vile individual. And uh, I got work to do. You know, work to do for the Lord. But I just wanted to put this thing together to warn you out there. Um, this guy's a wicked man. Very, very wicked. So, uh, I think a guy like this, you know, you say, well, we should pray for his salvation. Well, It'd be nice to see the guy that gets saved and things like that, but brethren, you got to realize that there are some people, too, that have crossed the line, and they're not ignorant, 
and they're actually studying the truth so that they can attack the truth and twist it. And Martin Richling is one of those. It's not just ignorance to come out and say that Jesus Christ was a created being. Uh, that's very serious. That is blasphemy. That's extremely serious. And uh, I don't have much time for somebody like that, to be very honest with you. Uh, would I like to see the guy get saved? Yeah, I would, but uh, he'd have to get rid of his whole ministry. And I don't think the guy is going to do that because he's also extremely prideful. And uh, so, and then about, you know, oh, he has to submit to you, Brian Denlinger. No, 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 that isn't it. He has to submit to the book. You know, but, and, and you know, I'll say one other thing, too, here before I close. You know, you say, well, I still don't think he's a Catholic. Okay, uh, who did Catholics burn back in the Dark Ages? They burned up uh, heretics. And what did they do? They went out hunting for heretics. Uh, the only reason I've ever attacked different men that are King James only and whatever else is because a lot of the brethren have tried to, you know, have contacted me. God, you got to answer this guy. you got to answer this guy. I attacked Stephen Anderson. I've attacked Mike Hoggard. Um, Stephen Anderson, I don't believe, is saved. Mike Hoggard, I'm iffy on that guy. I think that he's got some major pride issues and doesn't want to be corrected. Uh, do I think he's lost? Well, I don't know about him. He's said some very serious things, and I'm going, oh boy, I don't know about him. Um, but Anderson, I question his salvation because he hates the Jews so much and because he's off in so many other areas. But uh, this guy... Martin Richling, you can see plainly that this man is not saved. And, you know, if you are saved, you can, you can tell just listening to the guy. It doesn't take you more than about five minutes to listen to the guy, and you can just feel that the spirit is different in him. So, that's all I'm going to say about Martin Richling. I'm not going to waste any more of my time on the guy. i um, going to be bringing out a lot of other studies here coming up. Um, we both... Uh, my wife and I have been working on research uh, for a lot of very interesting things. We're both working on some more things that we're going to come out with. and uh, So that will be it for my studies on Martin Richling. Um, if he continues with his foolishness, I'm just going to have to ban him from the channel. Just as simple as that. A uh, man that is an heretic after the first and the second admonition, reject. Okay. I'm not going to make a list of heretics to be burned at the stake or something like Richling does. No, I'm just going to say, oh, he's a heretic. And that's it. So, that will be it for this video. Thank you for watching. Okay, I want to do another video here about this Martin Richling guy. I know I said I wasn't going to do any more, but uh, two emails have convinced me that I need to say something else because this guy is a lot more dangerous than I had previously realized um, and I have a responsibility to warn the flock okay there are a lot of people that are new to the Bible believing King James Bible believing issue and they can see a guy like Martin Richling and think that he's a King James Bible believer and get messed up okay and I know even a novice Christian can see through the guy sees wicked and evil and everything else I understand that but uh, I'm just going to make this video anyhow. Okay, The first email that I got, and I'm not going to be sharing this one uh, because I don't know if she will want me to or not, but uh, there was a sister that wrote to me, and uh, you can post your comments down there if you want to in the comments section. And she's basically uh, looking at a divorce coming up as a result of Martin Richling. Martin Richling has gotten to her son and to her husband, and they are going to leave her. As a result, you say, "Well, Brian, what if what if this uh, what if this woman is is wrong and she's bad? What that doesn't give you grounds for a divorce, even if this sister and I don't believe she, that she's bad. Okay, if you're watching, you know I don't believe that you're bad. But what I'm saying is, even if you're the most apostate, you know, wicked, whatever, your husband still needs to stay with you and still needs to talk to you about these things. Uh, spiritual." apostasy is not scriptural grounds for divorce all right that's not you have no right to divorce a wife because she doesn't agree with you on certain passages of the bible all right that doesn't work so that right there i thought was very tragic that martin richling is actually destroying
people's minds to the point where they would actually divorce, a, a man would actually divorce his wife because of Martin Richling's teaching. That's very serious. But you see, I found out something even more serious. And this is, not only is it uh, uh, very, very serious, but it totally disqualifies Martin Richling from being a pastor. Um, I mean, this guy is incredibly evil. All right. Now, I have the letter, and the man that sent it to me is a man that has known Martin Richling for over 30 years. Okay, This guy knew him long, long, long ago, and uh, he knows some very uh, bad things about Martin Richling, some things that need to be brought out. Now, I will say this. The guy that sent me the email, I believe he's hyper-dispensational, and I disagree with that. Okay, I, He disagrees with me on the thing of salvation, whatever else. Okay, We're not going to get into that in this, in this uh, video here. But I need to show you what Martin Richling's past is all about as a professing Christian. Okay, this is not his... I, I won't judge a man because of his past lost life, okay? Richling, I said things about him being in prison and stuff, and that's supposedly where he got saved and whatever, and he was a crooked cop before then. And the only reason I, only reason I brought that up is because he, he does not come out and say, hey, it was bad, I did some, some things wrong. He never showed repentance for his former life. That's why I judge him, okay? Because I don't think he ever came out of his former life. We're going to see that in this email here. Um, and this letter... I have it posted down in the description box. See, so all you got to do is you can click on it. It's word for word, verbatim, from the way the guy sent it to me. Um, his name's Steve Bruni. He sent the thing. I'm going to read it right here online for everybody to see, because it's very important to understand what Martin Richling is all about. Let's begin here. It says, I wish for the letter to be published in its entirety, as I believe my life may be at risk, and I believe the context lends support to its veracity. So here it is. I'm publishing it. And it's in, in its entirety as well. As the sum of the events happened almost 30 years ago, and the exact minute, hour, day, and week may not be perfect, they all preceded Martin Richling's incarceration for corruption. Okay, for this, for the record, I believe Brother Phelps is a saved man. I fundamentally disagree with some of his inter interpretations and application of the Bible. Truth be told, I align myself with Richling's but not his ex execution of those truths. Some of the beliefs Martin espouses, I taught him. Again, I would disagree with him on a lot of what Martin Richling teaches, but we need to get into the actual what Richling has done in his past and the fact that he's never repented of this. Again, these events followed his salvation and preceded his incarceration where he claims his salvation, his true conversion, in other words. I met Martin at the Shorewood Bible Church around 1985. I was disheartened by the legalism I encountered in a Baptist church. I joined after my salvation, April 1, 1980. I started to find the truth not in legalism, but in grace. It led me to meeting Charles Richard Jordan at the Chicago-based Berean Bible Society. Berean Bible Society is a name of hyperdispensationalism. Okay, It's a hyperdispensational group. All right. And you got to watch out for that. I've talked about that in other sermons. But we'll continue here. He had been called up from the South to be the next president of the society. While up, er up here, he acted as the interim pastor at Shorewood till one could be chosen. I met Martin, who at the time was a nighttime or night security guard. He had been recently saved because his uncle had consistently challenged his Roman Catholic beliefs. Finally, the Lord broke him down, and he trusted Christ's death as payment for his sins or for his sin, excuse me. Now, I believe what happened in reality is Martin Richling, uh, it's all his his uh, relationship to the Lord is all up here. You know, uh, they ha he has the knowledge of the Lord and Savior Jesus Christ, but he's never actually come to the Lord as a sinner and called upon the name of the Lord to be saved, okay? He's not about to repent of his past. And his past needs to be repented of, okay? This guy's wicked, very, very, very wicked. Martin had been married twice prior to his salvation. One resulted in a child he completely walked away from. This will happen again after his salvation and just pre his incarceration. You uh, have a child and you walk away from the child? 
The Bible says, if any provide not for his own, and especially for those of his own house, he hath denied the faith, and is worse than an infidel. And he's a pastor. Sure, sure. Right. I met Martin one Wednesday night at Bible study and hit it off. Martin was outgoing and extremely charismatic. His job behind a desk allowed him plenty of time to read through his KJV as his job was at night. He and I grew to become friends. Our conversations were mainly biblical in nature. One evening I remembered learning that in the KJV that the middle book, the middle chapter, the middle verse, middle two words are the Lord. Amazing. And I have a video on that. That's actually not true. It was found out later on. It's, it's another verse in Psalm. But uh, anyhow, being an Acts 9 dispensational church, I joked with him saying, you're not going to believe what the middle word in Paul's epistles, not book, chapter, verse, words were, he spent nearly three hours counting words before I called him back to tell him it was a joke. He was truly a devoted, saved Bible believer. I don't believe the saved part. You're going to see why. During our stay at Shorewood, Martin had written numerous salvation tracts, had led many folks to Christ from roughly 1986 through 88. Our church would spend a Saturday passing out tracts and street preaching. It was during this time that we came across a tract that Jordan okayed, that was passed out, which was a Lordship Salvation tract. Uh, I don't know about that, but anyhow. The young man which brought it forward, who was fairly new to grace, but had a zeal for souls, was shocked when he really saw what the tract said. This young man would eventually step forward, marry, and adopt the three children Martin would marry and sire and abandon later. <laughs> nice group. Martin uh, tired of his job with security and came to work for me. I was a painting contractor studying for the ministry. He worked for me for roughly seven months. Towards the end, a new pastor was found for Shorewood. Jordan was going to need all his resources for the Brian Bible Society. Jordan would need a assistant. Martin had continued to grow in his knowledge of the KJV and Grace. Richard Jordan was a strong proponent of the mid or for the mid Acts, which I believe is correct, and KJV, which I believe is preserved, not inspired. Again, I have issues with that. There was a revolt in the mid acts movement away from the KJV-only stand at the Bible Society and its financial supporters. Martin overheard a compromise struck between the then-presiding President Cornelius Stamm, C.R. Stamm there. Uh, he's written books of, of, about the whole hyper-dispensational system. And the soon-to-be Richard Jordan to cut back on the KJV rhetoric. The proof was evidenced in a September, October, November 1988 Berean searchlight magazine where Jordan compromised his KJV stance that it was adequate, sufficient for the purpose, really God's word sufficient or super abounding. To his credit, Martin called Jordan on it with folks at conferences and at Shorewood that Jordan had to make a decision. To his great credit, Jordan chose the truth. They both lost their jobs and curiously, the Berean Bible Society has expunged that period of history from their society. If you dig hard enough, you'll find what I'm saying is the truth. My wife at the time had a best friend whom we introduced to Martin. They soon wed and in time had three lovely daughters, two of them twins. After his dismissal from the Berean Bible Society, his wife, through connections her father knew, got him a job as a policeman in Melrose Park, there in Chicago. Okay. He had been training his Rottweiler, Boris. He was able to incorporate him into his job. He began training on the side. It was during this time he began training my neighbor's Akita. It was during the, this period of time that Martin started fornicating with my neighbor's girlfriend. He's a married man and he's committing fornication with a other man's girlfriend. As a professing Christian. It was discovered and culminated in a plan to run off with her and desert this family. I don't remember what stopped it, but his wife forgave him and they went on. While on the force, he told me of the corruption there and that he had been approached by the FBI to be a snitch. He refused. His brother-in-law was also on the force, a genuinely good guy. After several years, I noticed a change in him. He wasn't speaking about the Bible nor giving the gospel out as much. He started purchasing things a quote-unquote new cop couldn't afford. Gee, wonder where he's getting the money from. He goes on to tell you. I found out later he'd through his job had met and fornicated with over 50 women, some to get out of tickets. He'd also been shaking down traffic stops, in particular illegals, on Friday, payday. 
He said they didn't like banks, so they would keep large amounts of cash either on them or at home. He said he could spot them driving because they had on cowboy hats. When the money was exchanged, no words were exchanged, for he feared wires. A gesture rubbing his thumb across his fingers. No, I fear wires, like that, you know. I guess that's what it was, anyhow. Towards the end, he started fornicating with one of the cop's wives. Several shakedowns went bad, and he and his partner were busted. During this time, he moved in with the girl, this girl, and left his wife and kids. The husband of the wife he now was with testified against him. Martin con confided in me later he wasn't poetic just justice. He got immunity. Uh, he was rightly convicted and was jailed. Not sure if he married this new girl, but after he went to prison, she left him. There are many things I left out for brevity's sake, as this isn't the easiest thing to do, drudging up the past. These are all tr true Steve Bruni. Right there you have it. Okay? So, by that standard alone, the Bible says that a bishop is to be the husband of one wife. All right? Richling has had countless women as a professing Christian. Uh, so that test right there, he's disqualified from being a pastor. He has no right to be preaching the Word of God. And if it's true that he has been with at least 50 women, that he has blackmailed them into committing fornication, this man is not a saved man. I know that a saved man can get messed up and can do things that are stupid and whatever else, but that's the kind of stuff, that's the kind of thing Bill Clinton was doing in Arkansas. I mean, we are talking a very, very corrupt man, a very dangerous man, extremely dangerous. And I just, I had to make this other video. I needed to share this thing. He asked me to help get this thing out. I want to get it out there. People, if you know of anybody that is following this Richling, warn them. All right? This isn't just a matter of, well, you know, he's kind of eh, a little messed up. or This guy is a serious, serious false prophet. And Martin Richling, if you are watching this video, you need to drop your pride and your self-righteousness your only chance of getting saved is that you need to come to God as a repentant sinner. You need to come to Him in a broken state. You're not broken yet. Your relationship with the Lord is strictly intellectual right now. It's all up here. It was Roman Catholicism all those years, and then you saw some guy that had superior intellect to you. So you said, I'm going to study that so I can have that superior intellect. That's all it is. Martin Richling is not a saved man. There's no way. There is no way that a man doing all those things is a saved man that has the Holy Spirit of God in him. Uh-uh. Uh-uh. I've been saved too long. Okay? I know. I can spot people like that. I mean, give me a break. <laughs> Even if you're not saved that long, you should be able to spot this guy as a, a false convert. So, please warn everybody you know about this Martin Richling. All right? Uh, we need to get this guy shut down. We need to get this guy to be silent because he's making real true Bible believers look bad all right, by feigning that he's one of us. He's not one of us. All right, So that's going to be it for this video. I, just, I needed to make this thing because that email just really blew my mind. I thought, wow, you know, very, very bad. So that's going to be it. Thank you for watching, and uh, let's pray that this guy either gets saved or gets gone. We need to get rid of this guy from the realm of Bible believers on YouTube. We need to get this guy off of this, off of this uh, website, YouTube. So that's it. Thank you.